Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt, joined by United States Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas. Good morning, Senator. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. It's good to be on with you, as always. I, I, have you ever been on the Gallagher show, Senator, or are you considered too young for that demo? <laughs> I've heard you this morning, Hugh. I apparently, uh, unless you're part of the silent generation born in the 1920s and 30s, you're too, uh, too young for that demo. <laughs> Well, I, I'm just telling you, he's got this new line of walkers out, and I just want to recommend it. If, if either of your parents or your grandparents just need a walker, the Gallagher walker is really something. I got to tell you, you're in the news this morning. You may not even know it because it's in the Daily Mail in the United Kingdom. And uh, you got to be aware, there's an, a warrant out for your arrest for newspaper homicide. You are being credited with killing the New York Times op-ed. It says here that in your June 2020 op-ed sent in the troops led to a series of events that culminated yesterday in the announcement that the op-ed is dead at the New York Times. They will now be called guest editorials. And your fingerprints are all over this uh, chain of proximate cause. Hugh, <laughs> well, I did see that news. Daily Mail is a great uh, news source to wake up to uh, in the morning. So they're a few hours ahead of us. And I have to say, uh, I, I don't regret killing off a 50-year tradition at the New York Times. I can only say this kind of hasty rash decision would not have been made back when I owned the New York Times last summer. <laughs> it, was a, it was a brief but wonderful time in the, in the lifespan of the newspaper. But the, uh, the, the after effects, the, uh, the, the aftershocks of your brief tenure in charge of the New York Times have been enduring and the paper may never recover. All right, Senator, let's get serious. I got the, uh, the story of the day is on the census. And I am worried by this because for the only... The, uh, the second time, the second slowest rate since the government started counting in 1790 as our population increased. The 1930s, we had a bad decade. We just had a terrible decade. We need people to have babies and we need immigration reform. And you are one of the proponents of immigration reform. On the positive side of the ledger, we all know what a nightmare the southern border is, and we can talk about that later. What is the cotton plan for getting immigration right? So, Hugh, a few years back, I introduced my RAISE Act, uh, and that's focused solely on uh, our green card system, which is the way we create new citizens. To me, the most important part of our immigration system. It's certainly important that we secure our border and we enforce our immigration laws. Um, we need a careful review of those non-immigrant visas that guest workers get uh, and whether they're needed in our economy in different sectors. But the most important thing of any immigration system can do you is naturalize new American citizens. And right now, our um, green card system is completely divorced from the needs and the economic realities of our country. Uh, only about one out of 14 green cards of the million plus green cards that we have out a year is remotely tied uh, to genuine economic need. Most of them are given away to family members. They're given away um, to uh, winners of the diversity lottery. There's crazy quotas and set-asides where we clearly don't have needs, like several thousand a year for lawyers. I think most Americans would agree the last thing we need is to bring more lawyers into our country. So I will agree my, with that 100 percent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what my, my system would do to you is model someone on the, the Canadian system, the Australian system, which are often held up as the best models in the world, would be very simple, very straightforward. It assigned a certain number of points uh, to foreigners who want to immigrate to our country based on their age, younger is better, so they have more time to make a life here, more time to make money, more time to pay taxes into our system. Um, education and practical uh, fields like science and technology and engineering gets the most points. Uh, English language skills uh, gets more points. Um, there's points awarded for any kind of exceptional skill, say you're an Olympic athlete or you're a Nobel Prize winner, or you win other prestigious um, prizes from around the world. And then it would just award those um, points and give the highest number of points getters every six months the green cards. Um, so it would transform us from a very backward uh, immigration system that looks towards what's happened over the last, say, four decades, and looks instead towards what we need over the next four decades to help grow our economy. Now, I can't stress this enough. I talked with Byron York uh, earlier in the show, and Byron said, look, green cards have been holding steady. We give out about a million a year for 40 years or 50 years. My theory, if you give out the right ones, you should be giving out double and triple that. We cannot, we can't compete with India and China in an age where artificial intelligence depends upon data sets and economic skills that are not in great supply here, including computer technology, engineering, STEM skills. 
with two countries with 1.3 billion people. We will get wiped out. We need to get people here. And what is the reception your immigration plan has received on both sides of the aisle? Well, Hugh, it's right that we need the right skill mix here. And, and we want that's the people who come here and train here and work here to actually become citizens in the long run. You hear a lot about um, guest worker visas, things like the H-1B worker visa, or H-2 or the J-1 or so forth. Remember, there's a word left out of all those terms. Those are non-immigrant visas, which means those people are not going to make a life here. We should not be training the world's best and brightest if they don't want to come here and stay here. That's why I've got legislation, for instance, that would exclude any Chinese national from doctorate or postdoc study at national laboratories and sensitive fields if they're not going to immigrate here and, and, and be a full-time citizen for the rest of their lives here. We don't want them going back to China uh, and helping the PLA and the CCP in all those fields. Um, that's why we need a system that looks to the future and our economic needs. Now, this system itself um, actually gets a lot of support from both Republicans and Democrats. The issue becomes when Democrats think that they need to get something in return that is obviously a deal breaker, like a massive amnesty um, or uh, a refusal to enforce our immigration laws either at the border or at the workforce. Um, so if we can just focus on this most important part of our immigration system, which is our naturalization process for creating new citizens, I think we would be able to find bipartisan support. Now, Senator Cotton, because we probably have some daylight between us here, <clears throat> because I think it's so important to get this right and get the right people here in enough numbers to keep the country productive, competitive, and in first place and exceptional. I, I would like a commission, and I had President Bush on last week, and I wouldn't mind if he and Clinton got together and brought you in and brought a couple of people in from left and right, and you all sat down and reasoned together, and it's Kissinger rule. The more issues you put on the table, the more likely you are to get a deal because everyone gets something. Is there not a comprehensive deal out there that, I mean, not one, uh, God love Lindsey Graham, but I don't want a gang of 20 or a gang of 30 or a gang of 10. You guys always screw it up because the same staff makes the same mistake. Is there not a solution that's comprehensive to get more people here and to secure the border and to take care of the people who are, uh, they, they need to be regularized. I don't like the word amnesty because I don't believe in citizenship for these folks for 20 or 30 years, but is there not a deal to be had to get uh, an overhaul that we desperately need. The census underscores it. We desperately need an overhaul. Well, uh, Hugh, I have to say this is one place where I'm not sure that Dr. Kissinger's dictum applies, and that's in part because those of us who believe uh, in securing our borders and enforcing our immigration laws, believe in national sovereignty, believe that we have to have an immigration system that serves the interest of Americans, not foremost the interest of foreigners, um, have seen the rug pulled out from underneath us too many times over the years. The best example of this is the 1986 immigration legislation. It had an immediate amnesty, it had enforcement money, and it had other legal reforms. The amnesty happened, and that's irreversible. Once an amnesty happens and people become citizens or even become green card holders, that cannot be reversed. However, the enforcement didn't really happen. Um, future Congresses defunded it, the bureaucracy slow rolled it, Advocacy groups on both sides, like the ACLU and the chamber, went to court to enjoin it. That's why we ended up with another 15 or 20 million illegal aliens in the country since 1986. So um, people who want to control immigration and have an immigration system that works in the best interest of Americans first um, don't want to play Charlie to the open borders crown Lucy once again with her pulling the football away. That's why it's so important as a precondition that you, you finish along the southern border and you reform our asylum laws so we don't see the chaos that uh, we have at the southern border now, and you provide uh, immigration and custom enforcement the tools they need to crack down on illegal immigration inside the country. And that includes you, that very much includes you, um, cracking down on unscrupulous employers who are using illegal labor, oftentimes exporting illegal labor, uh, to the detriment of American workers. That is all clearly doable. This is what I say in response. Yes, 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 and yes. We don't have to do Charlie and Brown in the football. We don't have to let Lucy do it. You can write a law that makes everything contingent on the completion of the wall. And I mean 900 miles. I don't mean what we've got. I mean where we need it. And, and you can rewrite the asylum rules so that we do not have Ali Ali in free asylum. And that can all be done. And the carrot can be big enough and the stick's powerful enough to get it done if we do it outside of Congress. I really don't think your staff, not you or not the cotton staff, 
But I don't think Congress as an institution is capable of shaking off the cobwebs on this stuff, Senator. Do you? <laughs> if you set a low bar for Congress, you should never be surprised when Congress still falls low underneath it. Um, but the one thing that Congress does have is political accountability, Hugh, um, at the ballot box. And especially in the Republican Party, Republican leaders were too long divorced from what Republican voters wanted. Um, you had too many people who basically had an open borders mindset uh, leading the Republican Party for 30 years. Um, the idea that we needed ever more immigration to include not just um, immigrants, but we needed more of those non-immigrant visas. And we could kind of make some general feints or gestures towards enforcement, but largely turned a blind eye to the illegal immigration that continued. So Republican voters, again, uh, feel pretty weary of buying into the kind of deal that has been proposed over and over again over the last three or four decades. I agree. The, the resistance to it has built up dramatically. And I told one of your colleagues at the last effort to have a gang of something or other called me up and asked me why I was opposed. I said, you guys always screw it up. You don't have in a wall. You don't even, I used to call it a double-sided, long, strong fencing. And they added some you know, nonsense words. I almost used a bad word there. And it didn't work. And of course I shot at it, as did every other person, because most people have common sense about it. I just don't think there's any common sense in Congress. Now, they'd have to validate whatever a commission came up with. But if they tried, would you at least read what they came up with at the end before you said yay or nay? Oh, sure. I mean, I would, I would listen to um, the thoughts of, of any um, well-informed, serious, and sober analysis about ways to improve our immigration system, or for that matter, ways to improve anything that uh, the Congress does. Um, but um, one thing that we've seen in recent years is that Republican voters uh, feel a little burned by even Republican leaders say nothing of Democrats. Um, and on this one, Republican voters are definitely right. Yeah, well, your, your buddy Mike Pompeo says about China, not trust but verify, but distrust and verify. And I believe what you're saying about immigration is how I feel about commissions and proposals. Don't trust and verify, but distrust whatever comes out and verify it. But nevertheless, give it a shot. Give it a shot. Senator Tom Cotton, uh, good luck in getting on The Gallagher Show. You're way too young to be a guest on The Gallagher Show, but we hope that he'll let you on sometime to talk immigration. Tom Cotton from Arkansas, America. Follow him at Sen Tom Cotton on Twitter.